George. La oh, we're going live. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your patience as we rounded everybody up backstage so we could kick this off. Uh, my name is John Hayato Brandehorse, uh, senior strategist at Btrax, and I will be emceeing the event. A little different from last year's emceeing experience, but I'm super excited to have everybody at the SF Pitch Night 2021, globally minded, physically distant. So first, let me quickly share my screen so that you all can see what the agenda is going to be like today. And I apologize, I will speak a little slower as I realize we have people from both all over the world, but many folks from Japan. So uh, thank you, everybody. Um, while the event will be taking place in English, I would just like to say that Nihon kara irashatteru kata wazawaza shumatsu no kono hayai jikan irashatte kurete arigato gozaimashita. Uh, for those of you who didn't understand, it's early in Japan, and I'm just thanking them for joining us on a Saturday morning. So here we go. Let's go to the next slide, going over the agenda quick. Basically, we started, and uh, we will be doing some introductions, and then we'll have five pitches, intermission, and that's also when the demo booths open. So you may have realized in the event chat there's a poll. Please don't start voting until you've actually had a chance to check out the demo booth. But that will be the poll that decides who the People's Choice Awards are for the demo booth. Uh, then we'll be having five more pitches after that five minute inter, uh, intermission. Then there'll be a judge's discussion, more time for you to join the demo booth, winner's announcement, and then we're going to close that. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Brandon Hill, CEO of Btrax, to uh, give a few words. Brandon, please join me on the virtual stage. And I believe he's getting approved. It's a very stringent process. Hey. Here we go. See me. Good. All right. Um, hey, my name is Brandon from Btrax. I'm in San Francisco, actually, in the Btrax office. Um, so thank you for joining SF Pitch Night 2021. Um, as you know, we had a lot of changes last 12 months and we have decided to make some changes to this particular event. Um, SF Pitch Night this year goes digital and actually this is the, the best way to connect multiple different cities. And this time we have two great startup cities, San Francisco, and Fukuoka, Japan. And we have five wonderful setups from each city to pitch. And it's gonna be very, very exciting. And those setups create solutions to all the challenges we are facing now. And stay tuned and it's gonna be very exciting. So uh, let's move forward with this. Joan, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brandon. And that was very exciting. And now moving forward, here we go. We will now be introducing our judges. So uh, would each would the judges please all join me on this platform here. I believe we're waiting on a few and I will announce them once they're all here. So, waiting on Jason, I believe. There we are. All right. As you can see, we have three judges. Let's first start off with Jason DePero, a design leader. Can Jason, please, a uh, quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, letting me be a part of this wonderful event today. I'm excited to be here uh, in spirit. Um, so as John said, uh, I'm a design leader who uh, has enjoyed making uh, R&D teams both at uh, Fortune 500 companies, as well as founding startups. I've um, done this across uh, med tech, uh, financial services, as well as robotics most recently, and at companies like Apple, Samsung, Capital One, and Silicon Valley Bank. So that's me, and I'm excited to uh, hear about all the awesome startups today. 
Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Next, we have Kate Carniocina, uh, who will give a short introduction also. Kate, you are currently muted, though. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Carniocina, and I'm the dean of the L'Oreal. Uh, I am not. I just muted Kate for a quick second because uh, we seem to have some feedback. Uh, Kate, you may have the the judges video and the regular video going at the same time. That might be why you're hearing uh, multiple times. Um, but we'll figure that out. Looks like she's figuring that out. We'll move on to the next judge quickly. Uh, George Panagio Takopoulos. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm George Panagio Takopoulos. I'm the Director of Global Innovation and Partnerships for Berkeley Skydeck. Uh, more specifically, what that means is I explore ways of expanding our program, taking it internationally, and collaborating with government organizations, academic institutions, and corporate partners to ensure that our startups have the best chances for success and that their tech needs are met and solved. Awesome. And this is actually a nice segue into today's winner will receive a guaranteed first round interview for Skydex Spring 2021 cohort. Uh, can you please give us a, a little introduction of what that means? Absolutely. So our cohort is uh, where we offer an investment of $105,000 in exchange for 5% equity. And the startups that will be participating will join um, an acceleration program um, of workshops, webinars, networking events that's really designed to provide you with uh, a lifetime of resources that don't expire. You get access to a network of 350 plus advisors, uh, countless office hours, customized workshops as needed, $500,000 in resources, and all this culminates in a demo day. Um, entry into this program makes you an affiliate of the university. You'll receive netberkeley.edu email address and resources that will help you throughout your entrepreneurial journey. Amazing. Thank you very much to Skydeck for this wonderful opportunity. And now we will be jumping into kind of dis discussing what you can expect now, everybody. So basically, we have pre recorded five minute pitches for each startup. And then we're going to be jumping into a three minute QA. So, in, during the QA, with about 30 seconds left, you may see my face pop back in. And that basically means to start wrapping up the Q&A and then we'll be moving on to the next person. So um, thank you very much, Kate, George, and Jason. And uh, let's move on to the next part. So time for the pitch battle to begin. So now we'll be having our judges also uh, turn off their video and audio. And so the full screen should be taking over with the pitches. And I will also be doing the same. You'll still be able to hear me. You just will not see me. So the first, the first startup to kick this event off is Sway, and here we go. Hey, everybody. I'm Julia Marsh. I am the CEO and co-founder of Sway. Sway harnesses the power of seaweed to create climate-positive replacements for single-use plastic packaging because plastic is a climate issue. Plastics threaten life at every step of the supply chain. From the oil refinery to our streets, waterways, and oceans, we know the harms that plastics cause. 160 million tons of plastic bags, wrappers, and pouches are produced across the globe every year, but only 1 to 3 percent of them are recycled, which means that the vast majority of that tonnage ends up in landfills or in nature, where it remains for centuries. So let's rethink the plastic problem. What if instead packaging could evolve from a material that only causes harm at every step of the supply chain into a material with the capacity to restore and replenish the planet? 
We can do that with seaweed. Seaweed is a regenerative resource that requires no fresh water, land, or pesticides to grow. Seaweed also replenishes ecosystems, mitigates ocean acidity, and can sequester up to 20 times more carbon than trees. The biggest retailers on the planet are looking for better solutions. Just two weeks ago, CVS, Target, and Walmart chose Sway as a winner of the Beyond the Bag Challenge. Why are these brands so interested in our idea? Because the alternatives just don't cut it. Corn-based plastics, PLA, are incredibly land, water, and energy intensive. And they're often combined with traditional plastics, meaning the material is still dependent on fossil fuels and requires special facilities to degrade. The same problems exist with sugarcane bioplastics, except that sugarcane production is also infamous for poor labor practices and polluting freshwater ecosystems. So what do we turn to? Well, there is trees. <laughs> Bioplastics derived from pine, birch, and eucalyptus are usually compostable and non-toxic, but this solution is still incredibly costly and input intensive, meaning there are major barriers to scale. Seaweed has the power to meet four major metrics for success where other replacements can't. Our packaging made from seaweed is non-toxic and compostable, cost competitive, carbon negative, that's a really exciting differentiator, and high performance. Our current product is 75% seaweed and 25% plants. There are some really exciting performance characteristics we've already identified. It's home compostable in four to six weeks with other food waste in a backyard compost. Um, it's 100% plant-based, biodegradable and non-toxic. It's heat sealable. It's got a 12 month shelf life. It's transparent, flexible, smooth and resilient. In fact, I've got it right here. You can see it's quite strong and resilient. And it's also printable, which is really important. There are three major factors that give sway and edge in this industry. First, our sourcing team has built a proprietary network of seaweed farms and a depth of knowledge in regenerative ocean farming. Second, our materials being designed to plug right into existing manufacturing equipment, meaning we're able to partner directly with our customers' existing converter network and providing a low lift transition to using our substrate. And finally, brands purchase finished packaging from sway with unlimited opportunities for marketing campaigns around this extraordinary, benevolent, carbon negative material. Thanks to our Beyond the Bag win, we have plans to pilot our seaweed based retail bags in quarter three of this year. We're also planning to launch poly bag trials in quarter four alongside some of the most impressive apparel and cosmetic brands in the United States. In the coming years, we'll launch more complex multi-layered packaging, including mailers, pouches, and the holy grail, which is food wrappers. The total addressable market for biodegradable packaging is about $242.7 billion globally. And our current projections show a path to profitability within the next couple of years. Our growing team includes my co-founder, Matt, who's spent years building corporate sustainability strategies, two PhD material engineers from UC Berkeley, Cliff Barr's former packaging sourcing manager, and we're also joined by an international cohort of seaweed experts that span from Indonesia to Mexico and beyond. Our 2021 development goals are focused on improving this materials performance characteristics, specifically its compatibility with traditional packaging equipment and its moisture barrier. We're also ensuring that we can sustainably scale seaweed processing and pilot with the partners of our choice as we develop some additional exciting co-products. Our goals are not just to eliminate plastic waste, but actually bring brands into the future beyond this idea of sustainability and into this new wave of regenerative uplifting value chains. In this way, we believe that we can scale carbon negative solutions and products and ultimately position Sway as a leader in the benevolent materials revolution. And ultimately, we're going to sway the future. Thank you so much for your time. Please feel welcome to visit our website at swaythefuture.com to learn more or at Sway the Future on every social platform. Thanks so much. All right, Kate, George, Jason, and Julia, please join the, the stage. Hi, everybody. Hi. All Julia, right. first. Uh, judges, please kick it off. I'm starting the three-minute timer now. 
Julia, that was so interesting. And I think it's a very important topic because we all know that we do need to deal with the massive amounts of waste somehow. Uh, the thing that caused my attention is the 12 months shelf life. Mm -hmm. Do you see any limitations of this? Do you see any liability issues? And how do you think the technology will emerge in the future? Do you think that there will be some um, solution to this? Yeah, uh, 12 month shelf life is actually an ideal time frame that most um, cosmetic or apparel brands would be looking for. So 12 months is right in that comfort zone. Um, however, we're looking at ways that we can use other natural additives to expand health, um, shelf life in a food packaging scenario where, you know, a, a Cliff Bar or a Snickers Mar might be sitting in a warehouse for a longer period of time. So what happens after 12 months? Uh, it starts to degrade, starts to decompose. Um, it's 100% bio-based, so it's its natural inclination to return to the earth. Um, but yeah, we're able to program the degradation timeline. Thank you. Hi, Julia, if you don't mind, I have a quick question. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> and what is the, um, do you have like data on how the uh, packaging reacts based on humidity levels or if they get wet or stored in a dry place or if I'm outside carrying groceries and it starts raining? Yes. So we are actually currently working alongside the USDA here in Berkeley to get proper performance characteristics. But what we know is just to give you an approximation, this current material that we have, if you were to expose it to water, it wouldn't start to dissolve. Um, if you were to submerge it in a bucket of water over the span of several hours, then it might start to degrade. So, so far, the moisture barrier would be the highest um, area of concern, but the performance characteristics we see so far are very, very promising. Um, it's also quite strong, as you can see. I'm like pulling as hard as I can. This is a, a feature that's really important if you're carrying heavy grocery items in a, in a retail bag from the store to your car. Got it. Thank you. Very cool work, Julia. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, wondering, as you were showing kind of the different milestones of the different packaging products that you're pursuing, is there any mark or labeling that you're uh, considering creating to kind of highlight the, the benefit and the type of material that it is to kind of differentiate between the plastics and even the, the bioplastics of today and what you envision for the future? Right. I love that you asked that question. Um, what makes our material so special is it's one of the very few home compostable materials that's entering the market, which means you can just put it in the backyard with your food waste. We really want to encourage a culture of conscious consumption where the average person feels empowered to make a change in the climate movement. So really clear messaging around that is extremely important, as well as a quantifiable number connected to the carbon negativity of the products. You know, this bag equates to this amount of carbon extracted or um, sequestered from the atmosphere. I'm really happy that you all three got questions in within that few <laughs> minutes. Uh, great answer, Julia, really great presentation. Uh, thank you. And we will be moving on to the second startup that we'll be pitching this evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Switching back on to thank you. screen share. And smoother as we go. Here we go. And judges, please turn off your video and audio. And here we go. Hello, everyone. This is Shota Higuchi from Kosa. Working up assembly line is repetitive. We are here to change it. With rising labor costs and high staff turnover, Factory owner need a system that is less reliant on staff to remain competitive. The use of robot in automobile industry are nothing new. So what is the problem? Industry robot do not work in food factory. Why? Robots are perfect for taking on mass production. However, uh, Manufacturing product with short life cycle and defined product variants are totally different. Traditional robot system present a challenge as they are too big place among existing assembly line. Long implementation period 
and significant upfront cost. Crossers is solving, solving this with a all in one package by limiting the task to pick and place and developing property, property, property algorithm we can apply to various food uh, shape, various food shape with uh, additional system integration. With, with advanced vision and sensor technology, closer robot can easily replicate pick and place done by staff. Robot, robot neighbor tire and get sick and suffer injuries, making them variable investment for business in range of manufacturing vertical. Conventional robot systems are very large and need dedicated assembly line. Crossers collaborate robots include the force sensing significance. Robot Robot can quickly be reconfigured to accommodate product redesign changes or even work on new line, making them extremely useful for manufacturing of product with short product life cycle, perfect for the food, food industry. Finally, our all-in-one package eliminates the long time of integration. Our robot has three steps for introduction, uh, trial period, choose a plan, and integration complete. No system integrator and dedicated maintenance mean much cheaper and affordable option for all, includes includes similar a uh, small smaller business which are not multinational corporation our business model is simple we change customer uh, monthly rental fee that cover maintenance according to one public food manufacturer we can cut staff expense by over 80 percent the global food robot Robotics market is expected to reach $3.1 billion by 2025. In addition, our business model can be applied not only to food factory, but also applied to customer factory, and medical factory, and retail as well. And we recently demonstrated the robot cafe with the Robot Capital of Japan Tsukubasti and show the proof of technology with same technical elements. We are giving lots of inquiries, both from large enterprise as well as from media. We have received many awards, including the James Dyson Award. When we like to go over team, as a co-founder, CEO, I, Shota Higuchi, I have been developing robots for more than 10 years old. I was proud champion of the International Robot Competition Robot Cup. Our team is made up of technical experts, so we are a strong team that can bootstrap for very first development and proof of concept. And we can be game changer in the Food automation. That's all of my presentation. Thank you. All right. Let's have George, Kate, Jason, and Shota please join us on the main stage. Looks like everybody's here. Uh, one, one thing to consider is we do have polls running on the stage uh, that are specific to the pitches. So I, I noticed that there was one about seaweed. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of people here like seaweed, uh, but that may be an assumption that um, is wrong, but we'll see. Uh, Shota-kun, please be ready. Please join us on the main stage. While we're waiting, uh, what did you all think? 
I guess I will join so people hear, see and hear me until we bring Shulta up. Uh, definitely impressive. Definitely, you know, wow. Um, I was not that smart uh, <laughs> at his age, but um, I wish I, I wish there was more around the business model, like, you know, having this in place of a human statistically increases productivity by X percent or decreases injury by X percent. I know there was, you know, some mention about that, but having specific quantifiable um, impact metrics is always super, super useful. Like well, how much could it speed up your, you know, production run or, or what have you? And what does that translate into dollars? That's what, you know, investors want to know, which ultimately are going to decide if it's going to succeed. Exactly. Oh. Sorry, I'm ready. No worries, Shota. Well, I, George was talking and I, I, I believe he can probably just sum up that question that uh, he was bringing up that he wanted more information about. So I'm going to disappear now. Yeah. Hi, Shota. Thank you. That, that was very impressive. Um, do you have any data around um, specifically like it putting this product in place of a human, how much it would increase productivity, <clears throat> how much it would save on, let's say, you know, insurance for, you know, employees, health insurance, or how much it would, how much value in dollars could I as a company, and I know that that varies across industries and, and organizations, could I save by having this product? Mm. As as I say in the uh, slide, uh, we already are uh, doing the pilot test with a uh, big company, full company. Then the uh, yeah, we already know that we can cut the cost over eighty percent. Okay. Okay. have kind of a human element question to your very impressive you know type of an enterprise have you encountered any pushbacks from you know maybe labor union groups maybe local governments you know people who are trying to protect the jobs that you're trying to automate mm. Mm, I, I think the uh, the uh, the labor The the work in, in the food factory there is so many problems the uh uh so labor shortage then I think the um, this is more a uh, big problem um, than uh uh the as I as you told labor shortage that. is the bigger problem than uh, trying to answer those jobs. Yes. Thank you. It's in a quick question from you, sir, and then we'll move quick on. Quick question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a quick one, but I will ask it. I, I wonder about, you know, these robotic applications to kind of build on what Kate was saying. I think there's two ways to go about it, replacing some human activity so that people can do something more interesting yeah, or yeah, getting yeah. them to work alongside humans. And I wonder, as you strike that balance, are you trying to amplify the existing workforce with your work or do you want to replace them so they can be unlocked to do more interesting things? Like what's your, uh, excuse me, what's your philosophy on how to kind of go about uh, automation? Can can say that question more. Uh, do you want your robot, your solution, to work alongside people, or are you kind of hoping to take a very specific task and automate that with your your first uh, product? Uh, we 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 just uh, want to uh, fo focusing on the uh, just for. Boring tasks like uh, just pick and play something like uh, the the tasks that actually the person mm, don't need to 
do yeah, something right their uh, task. I, I think the uh, the person should uh, do like the the communication task and more creative tasks. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you, Shota. So. All right, thank you very much for some very interesting and insightful questions. Thank you, Shota-san, and uh, we will see you again later. So I'm going to share my screen again once I'm able. So everybody, please. Here we go. As, as you can see, I'm still here. Uh, we need uh, one Shota-kun. We need you to leave the state. There we go. And now I'm able to share the screen again. My name is Frank co-founder of Excel. I founded and mixed the two companies in Silicon Valley before. One was an internet service provider called Bay Junction Technology, and the other one was a subscription-based software as a service company called Packet So I'm familiar with both business development, operation, management, technical know-how, and implementations. About two years ago, I went to Bali, Indonesia for a nephew's wedding. Although the wedding was full of happiness, I realized one of my cousin and his wife always have to accompany their 20 some years old epileptic daughter, my niece, at all times. My cousin and his wife told me they have hard time to cope with their daughter's condition, which is a tremendous burden to them, both physical and psychological. As a parent myself with a special kid, I am moved and feel for them, and I want to do something for epilepsy patients and their families. Around the same time, I met with Dr. Jeffrey Chong, our chief medical officer, and he was discussing how to help epilepsy patients to prevent injuries and live a better life in a large scale. That is how this project began. Therefore, at Encephalon, our focus is to predict and detect epileptic seizures for epilepsy patients. We provide a solution for improving patients' quality of life. Globally, there are 64 million epilepsy patients. Seizures always happen without warning. Patients can easily have severe injuries when they fall. In fact, this costs 1.15 billion per year on emergency services in the United States. We have a unique market position. Clinical brainwave capturing system is expensive, not portable, and cannot predict seizures. Consumer variables such as braces and watches cannot capture brainwave using EEG and cannot predict seizures. On the other hand, our portable solution can capture brainwave in real time and predict seizures. And we have our inconspicuous prototype ready. Based on our subscription model, US market size is 6 billion and globally is 114 billion. We monitor brainwave of patients in real time using a headset. Then we predict and detect seizures by sending the signal to our machine learning cloud services. Our service is self-learning and customized for each patient. To prevent accidents from happening, we alert patients before seizures on set so they have time to get themselves out of harm's way. Currently, we see of 90% on early seizures detections with 84% sensitivity, 95% specificity for data from 19 patients. Regarding revenue channels and B2B business model, we will have insurance covered prescription revenue from partnership with insurance company and healthcare service providers. And pharmaceutical companies partner with us to use our service for biodata monitoring to increase drugs advocacy. And we can also have direct patients monthly subscription. Moreover, we are not only limited to epilepsy, our algorithm, framework, infrastructure, and back end plug and play machine learning engine can be a tool to enable ourselves as well as the other companies who partner with us for building the solutions for infield vein trauma evaluation, autism, dementia, such as Alzheimer's, and ambulatory biodata monitoring. Our team consists of serial entrepreneurs, medical director and UCLA professor in epilepsy and neurophysiology, Stanford PhD in computational biology, UC Davis PhD in computer science 
who emphasize in machine learning. Plus, special advisor who is very experienced in insurance industry and also the chief medical officer of the largest medical group in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you very much for listening. And today I'm going. All right. Judges, please join. And Frank, you should be able to join now. All right. Just waiting on Mr. Frank and Cephalon. That was the most difficult company name that I had to remember how to say. Here we are. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Nice Frank, that was a great presentation. Really, really well done. Very interesting tech, super inspiring. Um, Thanks. I I wonder. I mean, you've you've hit all the all the bases around the business model, <laughs> the subscription. I mean, I, I heard it all. I heard all the buzzwords that make me excited. Uh, great. In, in, the great. Five, in the five minutes, that's what we can do, right? I mean, I, I get I get it. Um, on the on the you know high level, I wonder on the mm -hmm. kind of digging into it uh, side of things. You know, you showed on that last slide all the applicable mm -hmm. areas of it for in your life, and I saw the football helmet. Uh, not that I'm a football player, of course, but I, it made me think about hardware mm -hmm. for dementia, for epilepsy, for yes. football. You know, all these different places. Mm -hmm. Are you going to try and build all of these, uh, you know, products or even the sensors yourselves? Mm -hmm. or are you going to do license deals with different companies like? You know, mm -hmm. Apple. I saw on your list. Are you going to try and get that in the next pods or something like that? Or you know, mm -hmm. are, how how are you guys going to work this so that it gets everywhere? Yeah, basically, uh, right now we already have uh, our own hardware prototype. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, we we uh, put together like all the electrodes, the headset. I mean, things like that. But then, you know, eventually, we would like to also be able to partner up with other companies. Uh, to build different kinds of solutions because we understand um, epilepsy is, you know, one particular disease that we are dealing with right now, right? But then all the other ones, like say for example, autism, um, dementia, uh, or maybe you know, like uh, brain trauma evaluations. Those, you know, we need other companies to work with as well together uh, in order to be able to build solutions fast. So that's why you know, uh, the ultimate goal is you know we would like to be able to uh, make this as a uh, platform so that, you know, other companies will be able to use our platform to build those, you know, particular uh, solutions for different kinds of diseases as well. Of course, you know, we can also do as well, you know, like after we deal with, let's say, the epilepsy, we can also move on to other diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I hope that answers your questions. It does. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Frank, a question around testing. Did, was I correct in understanding that you have 19 uh, test subjects that you've tested it on? Yes, correct. And if, mm -hmm. Okay. And what is the plan or timeline of testing it on more subjects? Because I think that's going to be the number one thing. Yeah, definitely. That people look at. Yeah. Uh, basically, right now we are testing on 19 subjects. You know, um, you know, I mean, the data of 19, 19 subjects. But the thing is, you know, we are going to have, you know, our initial, uh, you know, trial uh, within the next two quarters. And what we are planning to do is, you know, we will first, you know, of course, do the uh, usability and practicality test. And then, you know, we will move on to the next stage, which is, you know, to find, you know, more human subjects, you know, to be able to, you know, like uh, uh, getting even more data um, to uh, do something like clinical trial. Okay, that will be the next stage. Right after the uh, the initial testing. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, that is all the time we have for Q and A. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. For uh, from the judges, and we will be moving on to the next startup. Um, please hold. All right. The next startup is startup number four is Denta Yori. Tanya, and today I'm going to present about Dentayori, a blended learning platform for dental community. If you think dentistry feels a bit far from your daily life, let's remember that all of us have teeth. Also, let me ask you, what do you think when you see these pictures? Which one gives better first impression?
I was born in a family of dentists. I was the rebellious one and got myself a design and management degree instead. However, after graduation, I ended up working in the family dental lab in Indonesia for more than 10 years. The biggest problem that we constantly faced was the lack of skilled workers despite the growing demand. We had to hire high school graduates to train them internally while paying salary. Dental technicians make dentures, crown bridge, and veneers that will be placed in patients' mouth by dentists. CAT CAM speeds up the production process, but dental technicians will always be needed since every tooth is unique and things need to be adjusted both on screen and manually. As we can see from the graph, there is clearly lack of dentists, dental technicians in Indonesia. The number of dental schools is increasing, but the number of dental technician schools is not. There is no national certification for dental technicians and dental nurses yet. While in Japan, there are many schools, but the number of young people getting into the dental industry decreased significantly. Another problem that we want to focus on is the mismatch between staff's level of education and the skills needed at the workplace. In dental lab nowadays, most of the work is done using CAD CAM and machine, but students are mostly taught to do manual works in dental works. In dental schools, orthodontists only learn about conventional dental braces, even though in the real life practice, demand for clear aligners are increasing. With that background, we came up with Dentayori as a solution. Dentayori helps companies in dental fields solving their internal training problems, helps former schools to give their students access to extra skills they will need at workplace and international network, and potential students can also join the program to try learning about dentistry before they enter formal dental education. Before COVID, dental field relied so much on face-to-face -face lectures. Most dental professionals and students are not used to digital platforms. Fortunately, because of COVID, they are forced to use digital tools as seminars and classes have gone online. Therefore, now is the perfect time to launch this project. We improve accessibility and reduce cost of education by moving some parts online to get the best of both worlds. Participants can learn and practice before they get the hands-on experience in group or work settings. Lecturers can also get an overview of the students beforehand. Research for blended learning in dental education only started a few years ago and practical use is still very rare. It cannot be 100% online as well, so partnership with existing players in the field is necessary. We use Google Classroom combined with other edtech tools as our initial learning management system, and we will adapt with the needs of the market as we go. These are the benefits for companies who use our service. On top of reducing the time needed for training, we reduce the cost and also reduce the burden of senior technicians. For new hires or students, we give them motivation, practical guides, and access to global exchange. In summary, we become the gateway for young people to experience learning and working in dental field. We monetize through course fee and business subscription for dental clinics, schools, and companies. We match dental companies and clinics with potential talents. Assuming that young people who are considering to enter higher education or workforce are our target market, with only 0.1% of and with a monthly course fee of around 150 US dollar, we aim to reach monthly sales of 4.25 million US dollar. We are proud to offer high quality affordable education for all and ensure our project to be profitable at the same time. Rather than getting high margin from small market, with our existing network and capabilities, we push ourselves to expand our solution for worldwide market. On top of that, we are committed to focus on social impact, such as fulfilling SDGs. Dentayori is an international collaboration between dental field experts, education technology experts, and also foreign students and worker welfare organization. The mix of the team is also our strong point, so we can break the silos and bring in fresh perspective to an otherwise very conservative industry. Thank you for your attention. Tanya, and today I'm going to present about the Mayori, a blended learning platform. There we go, sorry. All right, Tanya's here. Judges, Hi. take it away. Great job. 
Hi, Tanya. That was a really great presentation. I really kind of enjoyed the flow. You know, you really worked out your animation and, you know, it was, it was pretty impressive. You really told the story. Um, I was actually curious to hear a little more about your social impact because once you got to that stage, there was a very kind of, there was a blimp with three different icons and I just didn't catch what you were trying to get across. So if you could just elaborate on that. Okay, thank you for your question. So basically the social impact is the education, like the accessible education for all, the partnership for the goal, because we work um, like at, from the beginning, we work as an very international team. And it's also for like um, by like we give the dental community a better working environment as well. That's basically the goal. Uh, Thank you. Hello, Tom. Hi, Tanya. A uh, question for you Hi. about your uh, your testing. Do you have some live cohorts going on, or have you already run the program several times? Mm -hmm. So um, we are going to start um, the pilot project this um, April. So we're working um, together with my um, dental lab in Indonesia. So we will um, teach new um, employees in the lab. Um, and the one who will be teaching them is a dental um, technician school in Fukuoka, where I'm based right now. And um, the program is designed like the, the platform. The platform for now, we're using Google Classroom, but the content, we also combine it with um, the Tsunagaru, one of uh, our team um, members as well in this project. And also we add additional program from the school because most of the dental um, technician school in Japan, they're very... Um, like strong in the basics of dentistry. But one of the problem that they have that, 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 but we have that we will be all, we can also like help them is like to give them a more international access and exchange. So um, one of our, like one of our partner um, in the US, she is a dentist uh, in Japan back then, but now she moves in the US and she will be teaching um, the students in Indonesia and also the students in the Japan from the school who will be teaching our um, team in Indonesia to like some um, English um, words related to dentistry. So that's basically the concept. We want to give supportive, um, like support, like support to existing institutional, it's existing formal education in dentistry to make them more like, you know, um, um, international and global instead of very close. That's great. Yeah, thank you. And it, that's cool to hear that you have already have some partnerships underway as well to support the pilot. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That is all the time we have. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you, uh, Jason and Kate, for the great questions. We'll be moving on to the last startup before the intermission. So we need to open up some space on this backstage. Um, so um, shall I leave now? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. All right, here we go. Carpe Med. Hello, my name is Olashini Bello, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Carpe Med. Hi, my name is Kenneth Bang. Co In 2015, my fiance and I traveled to Tanzania from Germany, where I was stationed. Two days into the trip, she was bitten by a mosquito, and she began to feel increasingly unwell, so much so that we went to see the nearest doctor that we could find. Now, she had migraines, fainting spells, and really high fever. None of the doctors were able to diagnose her or run or decide to run any tests that could have found out what was wrong with her, but we didn't know what to do. We cut our trip short and went back to Germany, where I was stationed, and right from the airport, we went to a tropical doctor. This doctor also didn't do any tests, even though we asked and said, what else could be going on with her because she is so unwell? Again, we left with no answers. We went home. And a couple of hours later, she said to me, I feel like something is eating my brain. We went to the ER. Two spinal taps later, some tests were run. She was diagnosed with meningitis, which had been caused by the chikungunya virus. A competent doctor would have run these tests, but instead we went without these solutions, even though we had travel insurance. And my fiance was admitted to the hospital for three weeks in critical care. 
and we had two and a half years of following medical bills. Getting sick or hurt when traveling is inevitable, but we're here to help you bridge that gap. Google can't help you, concierge can't help you, but Carpe Med can. We enable you to quickly find high quality doctors to speak your language. What 9-11 did for airline safety is the same thing COVID-19 has done for travel health. COVID is an accelerant and the demand for accountable travel, medical solutions and options are at an extreme high. And what we've created is a mobile application that is your travel medical companion. It makes it easy to find and book that best in class care that you're seeking that speaks your language. In less than two minutes, you're in and you're finding that doctor that you need for a variety of medical practices that you're looking for. We've solved that unknown quality of care and we're gonna be the first to create travel medical community. We include in our product features of recommendation engine in language care, an SOS feature that automatically notifies local emergency services and your trusted travel contacts, as well as shareable health records and directives. The Carpe Med Doctor Network is independent and has integrity. And what that means is that you can't pay to be on our platform. And if your location doesn't have the high quality doctors that meet our levels, we will not recommend those doctors to you. We're currently piloting in three key high traffic destinations of Mexico, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. How does it work? Pre-trip, you create your community. You add your travel itinerary and share it. You share your health profiles with those trusted travel contacts. During the trip, if you encounter an emergency, you press SOS. The local emergency services are contacted as well as your travel contacts. In a non-emergency situation, you find the doctor you want to see and go visit them. Our business model is B2B partnerships. We want to be in the hand of travelers through existing relationships that they have with their employer or companies they do business with. That might include modern medical, fintech, as well as OTAs where they book their travel. We also have a B2C model where we go directly to consumer and provide an annual membership. We'll be launching the app store in about two weeks. And what that means is that we'll be able to satisfy the demands and needs of those for high quality travel medical in the countries that we service. Our first year will be focused on travel from US to overseas. And as we scale through year two and beyond, we'll be satisfying global multi-directional travel as countries reopen. Our mission is to enable you, the traveler, to travel confidently and safely. We ensure that your last mile for medical access is seamless and our vision is predictive health care on top of all the other things we provide. Thank you very much. We look forward to speaking with you. All right. I am actually going to leave so that both founders can join. Be back in a bit. Okay, I think we're missing one, but perhaps uh, good to good to go. We can we can get started. Sure, I'm I'm sure he's gonna get there. <laughs> All working on hop in. Yeah, yeah, it's a little buggy. Thanks for that presentation. I thought that that's super interesting and super cool, and very inspiring. Um, and I apologize if I missed this. Are you currently piloting this with maybe other travel organizations or? medical institutions from around the world? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that's what we're working on right now, commercial and strategic partnerships across local global you know, group travel operators, as well as booking services. <laughs> um, that's the part of development that we are right now. Um, so the pilot groups that have traveled so far have been individuals traveling to those countries that we are uh, sourced with. Got it, okay, all right, makes sense, thank you. Have you considered the model that's a little different when you work with local doctors, but you connect them to international medical translators? Because at least in this country, you know, access to and knowing the local system, knowing local medications, knowing, you know, 
where to access certain services is important, but there are, you know, there is a wide range of medical translators who usually works with hundreds, if not thousands of doctors over the years. So have you considered kind of aligning it in a slightly different fashion? Sure, thank you for your question, Kate. I think we've considered a few routes to make it as most convenient and accessible. And I think timeliness often becomes the hindrance, is being able to coordinate said translator with the doctor that you're going to see. Um, traditionally, if you went to an ER and they happen to have a translator, they can provide. And we also know it takes time for that translator to be accessible because most languages, you know, you would think that they're always there, but they're not. So we really want to make sure that we can find doctors that speak in the language that you speak. So if you're going there and you speak German on our platform, it's already been filtered. So you can find a German speaking doctor in Costa Rica and at least you'll alleviate that native language concern. So we really want to speed that up as much as possible. But thank you for that question. Definitely. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about kind of the pre-COVID situation. I think that COVID changed things a little bit where the translators are kind of on hand and have multiple connections and they're pretty savvy right now. So maybe look at the changing market a little bit again. I mean, things have sure. changed. Definitely, definitely we'll continue to look because that will help our business model as well if we can find additional language support. Thank you so much. Yeah, to kind of build upon that, if we have another minute or so, I wonder, you know, how have you guys shifted your strategy and plans as COVID has kind of unfolded, um, you know, over the last year? I mean, what, what has sort of affected how you've really set yourself up for success in the kind of coming year or two? Thanks for the question, Jason. So the company was founded pre-COVID um, and then COVID came along. And what was helpful is that it actually accelerated our case in the sense that a lot of folks thought travel medical was a nice to have before they traveled. And now they've become more aware. So that was number one. The second thing is that before COVID travel was at an all time historical global high, right? And so any person that's entering into the space would be chasing the dog's tail. Instead, right now we're able to personalize and customize our service and product for those that are traveling in future. How we've kind of I would say future proofed ourselves is that we understand that while COVID is a big issue, most illnesses and injuries while traveling abroad are of all the other kinds that we've all experienced. And those are things where folks are unsure whether they should seek care or not. So we do understand that obviously the world has changed and what that is, but we want to take advantage of the greater awareness, the demand for accountability with travel medical and making sure people don't feel the need. Like COVID has made you feel you can't stay and deal with an injury on your own or an illness on your own. You have to go seek a professional. And so I think that's reaffirmed through what we're doing today uh, with Carpe Med. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you for the great questions, Jason, Kate, and George. Uh, we will now have a, a five minute intermission. We're running about 10 minutes behind, but I'll be honest, I don't, I don't think that's so bad. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're in the stage, remember, so just FYI, we realize that most of you like seaweed. Most of you have been to Japan. Most of you are probably in Japan. Uh, no football players in the audience. Um, either you've been to the dentist in the last three months or it's been a little bit. Um, no judgment there, but uh, thank you for your honesty. And that many of you speak actually uh, a couple of different languages with right now, the winning answer being three different languages. So that's very impressive. Uh, so yeah, so please uh, take five minutes and we will be back in, uh, in five. So thank you very much. All. Oh, hi. Welcome back, everybody. All right. So we are going to be kicking off the second half. Um, B-Track staff, please welcome everybody back to the main stage who are in the sessions. And by the way, if you uh, were in the demo booth sessions, we hope you're enjoying uh, talking to, seeing some pitches from EV Moto PJ, Key Factors, Slow Fashion, and 
Gosnick, I believe. Um, also, thank you to the first half startups of Sway, Closer, Encephalon, Denta Iori, and Carbimet. So without further ado, let us kick off the second half with Smartin's presentation. Everyone, I'm Shumatsuki, CEO of Smartin. I have plenty of experience as traveler and also as accommodation manager at the hotel, guest house, and vacation rental. Now I'm running a few vacation rentals in Fuoka, Japan. I found out that one thing always bothers me as a traveler was also the burden to me as an accommodation manager. So this product is developed through my experiences from these two different perspectives. When you plan traveling, you can book accommodations online without any problem using these apps. But actually the problem starts when you arrive at the accommodation, filling out a paper checking form, fiscal key, and in person checking even in this corona, but coronavirus pandemic. Sometimes it's difficult to find where the key is placed when you stay at a vacation rental property, especially when you arrive in the midnight and rarely see things. Probably you all have frustrated by this situation at least once in a lifetime. Anyway, the check-in process takes up a lot of time and labor to both travelers and foundation operators. Smart In solves this problem with just a QR code. It's really easy to use. All the accommodation operator has to do is prepare the QR code and place it on the front desk or put it in the room door, anywhere the check-in takes place. When a reservation is made, the accommodation operator simply sends the individual link to the guest. The guest goes to Smart In from the link sign up and it fills in the form, then registration is complete. Smart in shows where the check-in takes place, so no worries about getting lost. All the guest has to do when they arrive is scanning the QR code. Then check-in is complete. No more waiting time for check-in. The facility uses smart lock the door is automatically unlocked after the scanning. Well, if not, just follow the instruction on the screen how to get the key just like this. The cu this customizability of the key management system is the core feature of SmartIn, which enable any kind of accommodations to, to introduce SmartIn at any time. In addition to the main function of the QR check-in, Current features include customers and booking management functions. To the guests, Smart In provides information hub to check the facility information at any time with their phones. We've been testing Smart In at some facilities now, and the results are remarkable. After using Smart In, accommodations save up to 40% of their labor. Messaging becomes 50% less than before, thanks to the information hub and the QR check-in. In the future, we will add more functions to make this management system. Of course, we will also be adding features for travelers to make their trips smarter and more enjoyable. Our main target is vacation rentals and small lodging facilities. The reason for this is that Larger facilities like big hotel brands have already developed their own operational system. In addition, the, more, the most recent survey shows that the global vacation rental market sizes continue to grow and travelers are getting more inclined towards vacation rental properties over hotels because of COVID-19. You see, people try to avoid the crowded hotel lobby packed with tourists, especially now. Just on Airbnb, there are 4 million plus hosts and 5.6 million listings there are our potential users. The business model is simple. It's a usage-based model that you can start using for free. SmartIn has the advantage of being very easy to use. Registration can be completed totally online, so you can start using right away. Whereas others, others require high initial investment of installing hardware. We pursue simplicity and customizability, 
so that our product fits to anyone, anywhere, at any time. We use web media and host communities for promotion. We will make partnerships with many other companies to optimize our customizing feature and for the promotion. This is our team and we will continue to work hard to make this reality. Thank you for your time. Everyone, I'm Shumatsuki, CEO oh. of Smart A. Stopping that. All right. Shun Matsuki should be joining in just a second. There we are. Hello. Hi, judges, take it away, please. Um, Shun, hi. Uh, hi. That's fucking amazing. <laughs> As you say it, it's really cool. Great idea. Uh, I totally see it. The only the only thing that I would be curious about is, you know, part of the part of the hotel, part of the accommodation experience is the experience that the staff provides you. So they kind of want that interaction in the beginning to own the relationship. Mm -hmm. Have you ever have you done any you know research on that or any thoughts on that? But the, you know that might be taking away a huge um, valuable element that that they want to own. Okay, so um, one thing is that we can customize how they handle the keys. So the customizability we have, so actually the hotels or vacation rentals, they can choose whether they actually meet the guest or not, or smart in. And secondly, even if they, um, <clears throat> even if they can, cannot meet the uh, guest by, by using smart in, uh, we we can just reduce the time of the check-in process. So the, for that time, for the time, the hosts or accommodations or hotels, they can use this time to more welcome the guests, we believe. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I really like the presentation, and I kind of agree with George that it's amazing, especially now when we want touchless everything. So you can concentrated in your presentation on the check-in process. Are you thinking about kind of the entire arch of your journey while you stay somewhere, like in terms of add-on services? And also I'd be curious about the checkout process. I think you can really kind of limit the human interaction, which is really important in the time of COVID by doing that. Thank you for the question. And so the checkout process is the same as in. So when the guests check out, they have to the QR again, not not goes to the host, so the host knows when the guest checked out. So the, if okay, I would just position the product as kind of the entirely touchless experience and not concentrate on just the check-in portion. But okay. it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Shun. Thank Thank you so much for that. That's really interesting, uh, particularly in the time of COVID, this idea of touchless. And I, I like what Kate was saying about the, the that whole arc experience of, of touchless and what that could mean. I do wonder, you were showing some of the, the logos of like Airbnb and, uh, you know, Travelocity and, and, and such. And I wonder with companies like Airbnb and VRBO or Verbo or whatever, whatever they, however they do it, um, how, how would they, or, or how have they reacted, or how do you think they'll react to somebody kind of taking a piece of that sort of end-to-end -end experience? I guess I, I kind of put forth like, is the model, do you become a partner, or do you ultimately need to begin owning that end-to-end -end experience in your own? Like now that introduces like hardware or, you know, more end-to-end -end experiences just surface, um, you know, hotels and such. Mm -hmm. So uh, we make partnership with OTAs like Airbnb and Booking.com because we actually help those hosts or the hosts that actually own the Airbnb and uh, Booking.com to help them to uh, their labors. So we don't take the uh, share of the Airbnb or Booking.com. We actually know of Airbnb, Booking.com and guests and hosts. It, we are between there. 
so that we help the Airbnb also, but also for the hotels. So we have both sides of the party. That's all the time we have for Q&A. Great questions, uh, great answer, Shun. Working on some amazing stuff. Uh, and we will be jumping over to the next startup, startup number seven. Bye, Shun. Bye, Molly. Uh, Saren. And so please, here we go. Hi there, I'm Yinka, founder of Saren. And our vision is to empower remote workers. The pandemic forced millions of US workers to work from home for the first time. And now work from home is here to stay. Over 40 million US workers, that's 30% of the workforce, will be remote into the future. But remote work brings many challenges. It's a whole new world for employers and employees, and our vision is to solve the biggest problems when enterprise workers are remote. The first problem we solve is... I'm actually going to start that over because it appears that the screen was not sharing. Apologies. Here we go. Hi there. I'm Yinka, founder of Seren. And our vision is to empower remote workers. The pandemic forced millions of US workers to work from home for the first time. And now work from home is here to stay. Over 40 million US workers, that's 30% of the workforce, will be remote into the future. But remote work brings many challenges. It's a whole new world for employers and employees. And our vision is to solve the biggest problems when enterprise workers are remote. The first problem we solve is one that I experienced personally when I worked from home for three years. Do you remember what the office feels like? Do you remember the last time you bumped into a coworker at work and had a fun, spontaneous conversation with them about a new idea you had at work or your weekend plans? Such informal conversations are impossible now, and yet they were key to helping us preserve our relationships in the office. And today, with our water cooler charts, work relationships are suffering. 73% of Gen Z workers feel lonely, and it affects both their mental health and the engagement at work. People lose a sense of purpose, and it can also affect career growth if people aren't able to find mentors. This is what I experienced when I worked from home. On the flip side, leaders are concerned that culture and innovation will erode without spontaneous informal conversations. There's research showing that serendipity increases collaboration by over 20%. Our solution, Siren, creates instant and custom water cooler calls among coworkers. Siren is like Clubhouse or Launch Club for Enterprise. I mean, I'll show you our product in a second. So first off, Siren works, Siren integrates with tools like Teams or Zoom, so it's convenient for workers to use our product. We ask people what topics they care about and use the channels as a proxy. And then we ask a bunch of questions about how long they want a conversation to last. And finally, the most important question we ask is, we ask people who they want to talk to, who they enjoy talking to, and who they don't want to talk to as much. Because we learned from user research that people have preferences about who they actually want to engage with in the office environment. And then our solution integrates with Google Calendar, so, people, so we know when people are free or busy. And when people want a conversation, they just click a com type a command in Slack, and then Siren will go and check who is available. And once it finds a good match for them, it will put them into an instant conversation in Slack for a live conversation using Skype or Teams. There are multiple substitutes, but no solution combines spontaneity with the personalization of choosing who and what you want to talk about. There are many tools for random conversations. And there are some tools that are somewhat spontaneous, but don't offer much in terms of personalization. And Siren is right here, blending spontaneity with personalized conversations for enterprise workers. In terms of traction, we've run a better with 100 users and validated the core need for our product. And in terms of pilots, we're looking to start with startups and work our way up to enterprise companies for pilots. But we, th we think the need of our product is greatest for larger companies. The market size is huge. We have a B2B SaaS model, and I want to focus on our initial pilot metrics to help companies you know, assess how useful our solution is for us. We're looking to measure how connected employees feel and how many people people are interacting with outside of pure work tasks. We've built a great team. Um, as founder, I have a background 
um, working in a Series A startup, and I've also worked on impact for millions of people across the world with the Gates Foundation, worked in consulting, and been a PM intern at Cisco. My CTO, Chilas, has eight years of engineering experience, and our business development lead has seven years of B2B SaaS experience. We also have an amazing team, mostly of Berkeley students, um, with expertise from machine learning all the way to software engineering. CERN is solving one of the most critical problems in remote work. Remote-only companies like GitLab or Modern Tribe have found that it's hard to preserve human connection and interactions while remote. This problem is going to magnify for enterprise companies with thousands of employees. If such companies cannot find a way to preserve innovation and culture while remote, they will not embrace remote work as fully and remote work's potential for good will not be realized. That potential for good includes more diverse hiring and workforces and better work-life flexibility for millions of people. We don't want remote work to fail. And so our vision is to solve this problem for remote work and go on to the next biggest problem for enterprise workers in remote work. Help us build this better future of work faster. Thank you. All right. Hi there. I'm well, Yinka, founder. All right. Well, Yinka, please join us. There we are. Perfect. Right on time, sir. All right. Judges, please. Who's first? Um, I can start. Hi, Linda. Thank you so much for sharing your presentation. And I completely agree with you. I think humans right now are really craving interaction. We all kind of, we're on Zoom meetings 24-7 and we want something to do that other than work. But I wanted to get your perspective on kind of this new research that's coming out, primarily out of Stanford, that says that um, excessive amount of screen time is actually very, very taxing on the humans. And there's, you know, this close eye-to-eye -eye contact, the fact that we don't move anymore. I mean, there are four different factors and they have fabulous paper that just came out. So are you thinking about incorporating something that's other than chats and conversation and this close eye-to-eye -eye contact, something that would actually get us to move to something different, I don't know, <laughs> dance, interact in some other way, other than this way that's already draining us over this, you know, for some people, like 60 hour work week. Great, thank you. That's a great question, Kate. Um, I'm familiar with the research. And, and the core thing is, Siren is supposed to be audio by default. So it's like, you know, people can have video if they want to, but we want to be like audio by default. And imagine taking a five minute walk around your neighborhood and you just like click a button and have a break with your coworkers. That's kind of what we're trying to do. But people don't need to be at their tables, you know, to use um, Siren. Audio is actually like the, the core default. Um, and we hope that we can also reduce people's meeting time. If you're having more informal conversations, maybe you don't need so many 30 minute back to back um, meetings. Thank you for that question. Um, I have a question. Do you think that do you think that this is going to be a consistently valuable thing, or do you think that you know, given if things go back to normal, you know, everyone is uh, mostly interacting in person, do you think it, do you think that's going to kind of be a little uh, curve for it that's going to drop down, or do you think it's just going to be as valuable and relevant as it is today? So we think it will be as valuable as relevant today, and we're build, and we're thinking of a platform of remote work solutions, not just protocol solutions. But the first core thing here is, if you had a campus like Google's campus, you had many employees who could never really meet to start with pre-COVID, and that's not going away. So we can even help people form better connections across offices that they would never have had, whether or not there was COVID, that's one. Coming down to COVID, we think many people want to work from home at least a couple of days a week, and there's lots of research showing that, but that will persist even after the pandemic. And so we think this is, as long as you think remote work will grow, we think we're in a good place. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Want to appreciate your presentation and, and just thank you for that. That was uh, super interesting and want to applaud your your pilots and the just the testing learn approach that you've clearly taken with your business. So first, just you know, appreciating that. Uh, my question, I want to I want to build off what Kate said again. Uh, Kate, you are consistently in my brain. I feel like uh, every time we start this, so I, I'm very happy about that. Even even from how far we are away, I feel like it's just because it's this one window right here. It's very mutual. Yeah. Imagine uh, if you had Saren. 
I imagine if we had. That would be much yeah. easier. <laughs> Can we get a couple betas over here? What do we, what do we need to do? Just send me your uh, email and I can send you. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, I, that, uh, I think it's the Jeremy Bailson uh, uh, document. Is that the one you were, you were talking about too, Alay and, and Kate? Is that the from Stanford's uh, VR lab on on kind of the impacts of sort of Zoom, the Zoomification of work life? Um, what, what are the stand, and I know we've, we've already talked about the audio only piece of that. And, um, you know, I, I wonder, about you know serendipity and the human-centered piece of it, I think caught me in the presentation, which are very inspiring to me personally. And trying to think about, um, you know, what are the what are the ways to generate serendipity? I think it's one, the people, and then two, kind of there's some spatial relationship. Um, I've always been a big fan in my offices of like putting everything on the walls and just seeing what conversations happen or don't happen around it. Uh, again, it's serendipity, right? And I wonder. Um, you know, is there a need for not just audio, but some visual piece? And I know there's been a few startups that have popped up to start creating these sort of virtual world looking spaces as well. And just wondering, you know, as you see it, like, where is that biggest bang for the buck? I mean, you've clearly taken this audio kind of approach to begin, but, you know, where does this go if we do stay remote? And if it is sort of this nomadic work, you know, remote work uh, kind of uh, play? So I would say for serendipity, you, you need, you need, you know, you need communication and context. So context is when you meet someone in the elevator, you know what they're doing there. You meet them in the lunchroom, it's easy. So we want to find ways to create that shared context, even if it's topics or activities, just a way in which you don't have to ask someone a random water cooler question because you have some sort of connection to what they're actually doing. That's how we thought about the design approach. And in the future, you can go on to 3D and all that stuff. But I think people, you know, just want don't want to wear gadgets just yet. It's just like, how do you make this feel very human, very natural and effortless? So it's a, it's very much a human centered design problem of how do you build a social network that feels fun to use, even though, you know, I'm not seeing someone in person. And in some ways we can make things better. Like we can actually help you find someone who you would better enjoy talking to than in real life. But we can't quite fix that, you know, someone is right in front of you, you can see every expression of their face, but there are things we can do better and we want to do those things um, better. So I hope that I hope that's helpful. On over time, but that that was a very insightful kind of Q and A. Uh, thank you, judges, again. Thank you, Olayunka, for a great presentation and Q and A. So we will be going to the next one. Let me make sure I don't screw this up. I think you should be seeing Sphere the slide, and let's jump over to the pitch. I'm Honda. Zenix Partner CEO, World Most Advanced Next House. Sophia, visit your house in 24 hours. CEO Koma, create the latest EV car in the world. Vision, we create the world most advanced house. This is our future. Adapt the world latest team product. Projection mapping, the latest IoT, motion control, security, off grid, personal robot, future bed, food 3D printer, pet robot. Can you really keep paying a 30 years mortgage? We only live once in freely. The biggest enemy of freedom is the house. I have 5,000 farmland and the house. I bought those for 30,000 US dollar. My housing loan was gone. Dream, I got to work, but I really wanted. I had no salary for two years. I chose spend more time with my family. I got a freedom and happiness. Senex is going to invent the house. A robot create a house in 24 hours. 100 square meter, 30,000 US dollar. Buy a house cost as much as car. The most longest, Sophia, physically. Generally, 
it's necessary to use skeleton structure when you build a building with 3D printer. Sophia is spherical so that the building itself makes structure without skeleton. Masayuki Sono, architect, he is making progress on NASA Mass Habitat Challenge. Roadmap in this year, Sophia prototype. In this year, after verification test of prototype, a test of 3D printer from USA. Sophia, 10 square meter for luxury camp. In 2022, Sophia, 100 square meter for living. Osaka Kansai Expo, 2025, step to the world. In the future, the world most advanced super city. Profit model, sales of house. Building cost is 10% since using concrete. CEO Honda, fifth time serial entrepreneur. CEO Koma, Koma Koreta, the latest EV car in the world. One company, Technology is limited. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. World most advanced next house. Collab 12 company. Major construction, house maker, material, IoT. We held a press release in Japan, announced that other 12 country, the world is waiting for the Sophia. 2025, Serendix get rid of housing loan from everyone. Get the freedom. Freedom, what do you want to? A job, what you really wanted? A dream, what do you really wanted? Spend more time with your family. Get the freedom you challenge. Get the freedom you choice. If housing loan be gone, what you want to do? Realize your freedom, fitting with Sufia project. My mission, no more housing loan. ありがとうございました. I'm Honda. All right. It's Honda-san here. Waiting, this, waiting for Mr. Honda to join. I didn't see uh, where he is right now, but uh, in the meantime, we might as well chat a little bit about the uh, the presentation. Who's interested in a sphere house? Looks really cool. Mm -hmm. Looks super cool as a concept. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, that's going to cause a lot of problems for uh, the Department of uh, the Interior because of tents. I'm sure a lot of people are going to start trying to print these things all over our national parks. <laughs> That's true. Oh, here we are. Hi. Hi, Honda. <laughs> Hello. Sorry for waiting. No worries. Who's got a question first? OK. I have a general question. First of all, I thought that was really cool, especially that sphere, like right overlooking the ocean. I mean, I would be like starting to shop right now. <laughs> At the same time, I also find that 
a lot of research has gone into those, um, you know, tiny home communities that are sprouting around the country right now. And the research from there is showing that people do value this freedom, no mortgage, and they really go for simplicity. So other than, you know, they're not really going after the latest and the greatest technology. They want to go back to basics, back to relationships, back to spending time with family. So I'm not sure that there is this connection between simplifying your life, going small, going into kind of uh, miniature homes, and at the same time, relying on the technology. So how big is this segment of people who kind of not urbanites for going after the latest and greatest, but people who want to live in those kind of um, secluded areas and at the same time really value technology. I'm just curious. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you can you ask me again, please? I wonder if you know how large is the segment of people who value simplifying their lives and at the same time really valuing technology. How big is this overlap? さん、ワールドマーケット。うん。あ、世界のマーケットがどのくらいあるかって。はい。うん。あの、200、600兆円。うん。そうね、マーケットはもう私が説明する以上にね、非常に大きいって、そこだけ言って。The living market is very huge. Uh 16 trillion US dollar. What percentage of population would be interested in this concept? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd be curious about the material that these uh, homes are printed in. Is it biodegradable? Can they just be destroyed and removed? Are they, I mean, they're not going to be biodegradable. Um, are they environmentally friendly? Um, how do you how do you account for how easy are they to to move around if you wanted to move them, yes. or are they just permanently there? Mm -hmm. uh, the, at the first, uh, in, in Japan, has many registration the law, so we are using a uh, concrete. The concrete uh, lead to a uh, cost down and would be uh, eco friendly. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, I, I want to kind of build off that, I mean, the idea of, I mean, concrete in, in, in its current state is one of the least eco-friendly materials on the, you know, that we produce. E concrete and steel are really the two, and we need them in everything. Uh, so I understand the choice, but I wonder, are you going after a new, you know, uh, formula? New or material. A new, type, mm. new material, thank you. Uh, mm. and, and is yeah, that why you've chosen, um, you know, 3D printing plus concrete? Mm. Like, is there... That's kind of your recipe for success. So, what? Why that choice? Is there is there something kind of under the under the covers there, so to speak, or or something more about why you you want that uh, combo? Ah, hmm. now we are on the FRP NDA. Hmm. Uh, we have uh, joined with a construction company to develop a uh, new material, not only concrete, uh, they are using uh, carbon. Mm. Uh, if, do you know FRP? Mm -hmm. It's based on the carbon material. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to develop uh, putting carbon in concrete and making a new material. Mm. 
Got it. So you want to sequester the, the carbon back into the concrete uh, mm -hmm. so that you get the environmental uh, output and then stuff mm -hmm. it back inside to sequester it inside. I, I think yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and those experiments are super interesting. I mean, they're about 30 percent efficiency, mm -hmm. and I know they want to get up to 70 percent. And we're, mm -hmm. we're a long way off. So it's interesting that, that you're going mm -hmm. down that path. Does the 3D printer help facilitate mm -hmm. that? Is that why you've gone down the path of print? Sorry, John, cut me off at any time, by the way. I know. I closed my chat. <laughs> I, You're I good. Fin it. Finish this thought, Jason, and uh, we'll move. We'll move on after that. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's very interesting, by the way, Honda. That's why I'm asking so many questions. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honda San. Uh, I was very impressed. Like I was like, how is he talking, but his lips aren't moving? Uh, but obviously, he had support on the translation piece. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Thanks for repeating your questions, speaking slowly, and we will move on to our next uh, startup, and we are nine of 10, so we are almost there. Uh, let's listen to hear what Opal Plan is up to. Hi there, I'm Brian O'Brien, founder of Opal Plan. We help ordinary people architect their own new simple buildings everywhere. Over my 20 years as an architect, two things have always struck me. How many people don't get to go to an architect at all and so miss out on the benefits we can bring? And secondly, that on simple buildings, the architects largely do the same things over and over again. These two things are true of most simple buildings across the world and led to the idea behind Opopna. Just take the case of new family houses. Half a million North American families build a new home every year. That's one new house every minute that needs a design plan on a budget. Currently, the vast majority of these plans are sourced from online stock plan websites. The problem with stock plans is they are pre-made and not tailored in any way for the buyer or their lot, in the way an architect would. And despite costing $2,000 on average, half won't fit on their lot, most can't be built within budget, and the majority are delivered in 2D formats that people can't understand. It's an outdated industry that's ripe for disruption. So we created a way to automate the architect process and solve these problems. Our solution, which is currently live, is unique. Quite simply, we create a personalized plan for your house or other building in minutes automatically. We start with the customer giving us a detailed brief online. They answer questions about their lot and location, the style and materials they prefer, and the rooms they want. Opal Plan that analyzes their inputs and automatically generates a new design for them in a few minutes. It's a design that's been created uniquely for them by our automated design system, and it's delivered in modern 3D formats that can be explored immersively online like this. But we are more than a design engine. Our platform operates as a project dashboard where the customer can explore their designs online but also edit, test, and change the other elements of their design journey over the 24-month life cycle. And once they are ready to apply for permits or start construction, they complete the purchase and download the design in various formats. Our customers are in this middle tier. Families who aren't happy with a subdivision house as they want to be hands-on in the design, but are unwilling to pay the high fees of an architect. Each cohort wants a different type of new house but all want to be able to visualize and understand what they are getting before building. We are a B2C business and our revenue model combines a recurring subscription with an e-commerce purchase. Customers start with a monthly subscription, which culminates after 18 to 24 months in a high value one-off purchase of their plans. We allow them discounted the subscription sums paid against this purchase and also offer the design in these advanced formats as upsell products. So while our ambition is global and across many building types, our first step is in the online house plan sector here, a market that critically is already well established. At current sales volumes, it's worth $1 billion here and $7 billion worldwide. But that's just a fraction of the design market for simple buildings in America and across the globe. Vertigo's architect can be applied to just as easily as with new houses. The go-to-market strategy combines content, ads, and guerrilla tactics to price customers away from incumbents and reach new customer segments. We're growing our usership steadily and on track to have great unit metrics over time. 
Later, we'll add partnerships and B2B services. Editors' offerings vary by level of customization offered and price point, with open plan aiming to occupy this sweet spot niche up here. Below us lays the most cohesive and established opposition and network of stock plan brands owned, in fact, all acquired relatively recently by Zonda Homes and Lee Wood. Our team includes our three co founders with complementary skills. I'm an architect of 28 years, Grony is our marketing expert, and Trevor is our solutions architect and next CTO. Along with Sean and Tom, we are all deeply passionate about this mission and determined to make it succeed. Today, we are looking for $750,000, which will take us within 12 months to proving product market fit and to become dominant in our beachhead states with strong sales revenues. That will in turn set us up to expand across North America and from there onto other building types and other geographies. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Let's let's uh, invite Brian up onto the stage for the Q and A. Hello there. Hi, Brian. Hi, guys. Hi, I can start over. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. I think that because of the time limit, you didn't really get to uh, really drill down on kind of the financial model. And I was particularly interested in the slide where you had your customer acquisition costs going to the CLV and kind of trying to flesh it out. So I just wanted to give you like a minute or so to potentially elaborate on this because I, <laughs> I just wanted kind of to hear more. Sure. Um, so we've been experimenting quite a bit with business models um, and because COVID has, has sort of disrupted many of the, the, the assumptions we had when we, when we uh, uh, were, were, were designing this up about a year ago. Uh, so we've recently decided that we're, we're, we're um, modeling a, a system we call SafeScription. So this is a subscription where uh, we are a portal and the customers come in, they build their design, they enjoy exploring their design, changing their design, and ultimately we have features where they can talk to other people in, in the same uh, journey uh, about designs and, and changing their uh, designs of what works best. They pay a monthly fee for that because we understand their journey very, very well. and They only actually want to, to, to buy the design when they're ready to go to the permit, to, to the permit, uh, get a permit or go to their builder. Uh, and that's usually 12 months in, sometimes even 18 months in. So we want to build a relationship with them. Um, so what we're promising, and it's unique among uh, the house plan uh, uh, sectors, is that they pay a monthly fee and at the end they, they buy their design, but less that month, less the totality of that monthly fee. Um, I'm looking at my spreadsheets here because we're selling right now. This is a sale came in uh, just earlier on tonight. Um, and the, 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 the CSE to CLV on that screen is already uh, way out of date and it's already improved by at least twice, but just in the last uh, three days. So uh, it's very new for us. We're, 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 we're running ads each weekend on a micro budget um, and we're learning a lot about it. So it's, it's, it's very exciting uh, and, and it's, it's, it's looks better every time I look at it. So look, that's, that's what I got for you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, you know, stuff that needs to be worked out, but you know, that's part of the process. Yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah, I got all the information I needed, Jason. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, want to second that, or, or third third that, that uh, love, the, love the direction you're headed. Um, I kind of have a, a bit of a thought, maybe experiment to, to dig into uh, really quickly sure. is I wonder if, you said uh, on the slide, it said the Wix of architecture, I think was the the, the tagline or kind of the, mm -hmm. the setup. And I wonder if it's the quicken of. The addition I, okay. I want to, to just put forth is like, do you still need an architect or, or perhaps a building engineer of some sort to be kind of ready to kind of help usher things along, particularly yeah. in strange municipalities where like building codes are different and stuff gets sure. strange, like, do you play yeah. that up and even into your business like because that would affect the product the business model etc down the line yeah. i mean what yeah. do you what do you think of those types of so, things so, uh, so know, that's that's part of the that's part of the journey because before we were b2c we were b2b uh, so that was about a year ago and we spent quite a bit of time talking to small builders um so we really got to understand them um and 
they said uh, to, to a builder, and we, we interviewed about 20 of them over a three day period, they said, do not try to be code compliant in the locality. There's, I don't know, 900 different code compliant uh, localities in the US. We do that. Um, we're, we're, we're based in two, two or three zip codes. We're based in a couple of counties. We know the place really well. And the customer comes to us. They will bring the designs for us. There'll be good designs, bad designs. If they come from me, they'll be the better, best designs they can buy online. We will change them to something that, that meets code and we'll take, take it from there. Um, don't waste your time and, and charge us more money to try to make it code compliant. We're not interested. We will be changing it anyway because we've got to talk to the customer from then on about what doors they like and, and you know materials and so on. So we know the journey. The journey is we take it as far as where the builder takes it over uh, or, or a local designer that works with the builder. Everybody, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I keep thank wanting to go but <laughs> thank you. And uh, we will be jumping off to the next one. XR Therapy is the the last of the ten to present today. Here we go. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present to you today. I'm going to introduce you to an innovative technology for medical and other forms of treatment. Have you been through a painful experience like this? Many treatments are painful, even though technology has advanced and we are constantly adding new conveniences to our lives, we deal with pain every day. Pain is often seen as an individual problem, but in fact, in Japan, economic loss from decreased work productivity due to pain is huge. It's estimated at billions of dollars. In the U.S., the opioid crisis, which stems from pain relief, has cost the country over $600 billion. Pain hurts in many ways, so I have developed a product that can reduce treatment related to pain and anxiety. It does this with less reliance on medications and less burden on the human body. It does this through what we call XR therapy. XR therapy uses a technique called VR distraction. This shows virtual reality images during a treatment. These reduce pain and anxiety. VR distraction uses virtual reality to focus the mind elsewhere. Reports have found that this method can reduce pain and anxiety up to 75%. Amount of anesthetic and medicine used can also potentially be reduced. Other companies have tried this, but their content is only passive, just being looked at. This doesn't maximize the effects of VR distraction. XR therapy is different. It's reduced pain and anxiety through immersive content and digitized hypnosis. When I was a college student, I met a professor who had studied hypnosis and used it in the medical field. He became my mentor. And as a hypnotherapist, I also provided counseling for depression and trauma. Hypnosis is a state of concentrating on one specific thing through suggestion. We in that state can remove the need for anesthetic. This is what it actually looks like. This is an extreme example, but by immersing yourself in one particular thing, you can eliminate the pain. That's exactly the same principle as VR destruction. Being a specialist in hypnosis, I see this is a viable product. Uh, the movie on the right is from a simplified demonstration we did at a dental clinic. Full-scale demonstrations will be conducted at five clinics with the MO product release around the summer. I've already talked about the benefits for the patient so far, but there are benefits for medical providers as well. VR can also be used for explaining treatment. This allows for clear communication. 
There are also reports on the need for less pain relief medication, which saves money and benefits both the patients and the medical providers. Here is the business model. The main targets are dental clinics, medical hair removal salons, and tattoo parlors. Pain-related data is also acquired based on the eyes pupil size during treatment. We will provide this to pharmaceutical companies and medical facilities aiming to become a pain platform. I myself have often gone to the hospital since I was young, and I still give myself injections into my nerves once a week. It's quite painful. I've experienced the pain of treatment many times, but I also found it very difficult to describe that pain in words. Our survey is aimed at not only reducing pain and anxiety, but also at realizing a better treatment experience by addressing pain digitally. I'm now seeking what you see here. If you are interested, please get in touch on LinkedIn, Facebook, or email. I'm Yucho Nijima, the founder of Excura. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. All right, I believe he's joining. And I actually may be dropping off to switch out with another uh, person who will help with translation. So let's confirm that uh, before I leave. Uh, and if I do stay, uh, I will help with translating as I, no questions asked, but I've been to a dental clinic, a hair removal salon, and a tattoo parlor. Too much information? I don't know. All right, Nijiba-san, just one second. Oh, I'm going to leave and have Taka join, OK? Um, OK, thank you. Shoshu matchka-san. Sukoshu nara wakarimasu. We're waiting for Taka, right? OK. Yeah, that's right. I think that's. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I didn't get to see the presentation because I was at the booth session, a demo booth session, but um, I'm I'm trying to do, to do my best here to translate. So yes, go ahead. Hi, Takahiro. Go ahead, Kate. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to say hi, but okay, I'll ask the first question. <laughs> um, my question was, first of all, how proven is the technology? Did you have like a field test that you actually established some kind of statistical significant reduction of the pain level? And my other question is that why tattoo parlors? It seems like people who self-select into getting a tattoo, it's kind of an optional experience, so they might not mind pain as much. I know that if there is something that reduces pain, for instance, I would have used it during like labor and delivery rather than reducing the pain from the tattoo. Just, you know, the, the main question, basically. Okay. Um, あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
So apparently there is a kind of technology that's hypno hypnosis, hypnosis, mm -hmm. and then like the VR combination um, can reduce the uh, pain. Apparently, um, there's kind of study for that. And uh, and the that's main question was, why tattoo the pain is focused on? にフォーカスしたものってあると思うんですけど、なぜタトゥーにしたのかっていう質問でした。あの、ま、例えばですけど、ペインクリニックとかですと、最初ペインクリニックも考えたんですけど、ペインクリニックの中、基本的に注射で
All right. Now the judges, please. Um, B track staff, please mention on the event stage, backstage uh, chats that we are going back to live and going to answer who the winners are. Ooh, that was a tough one, y'all. We had a lot of really great uh, startups pitching, so. Thank you for your patience, everybody, as uh, we started a couple minutes late. We're, we're making up the time, but we are going a little bit over. Um, just want to clarify also, do we have all the startups in the backstage? All right. Hi, Julia. Guess we'll have some music playing so you're not just looking at me. The judges should be joining me here any minute now. Oh my, I will be right back. I've been called away for a second. 